you be free from the burden of sin. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. From your passion and pride There's power in the blood Power in the blood Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide There's wonderful power in the blood Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood Power in the blood There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. God, thank you for this time. Pray you pour through Argel. You make him the well that he kind of disappears, <laughs> that uh, he be just a clean conduit that you can flow through this morning, and just in the way he says things, in the the, the nuances of it, Father, that it would reflect your heart to us, and then work in our hearts that we'd be able to receive the things you're saying to us this morning. We thank you for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. You know, uh, this week, Dan wrote to me and said, you know, what are you preaching on? You got any song recommendations? I'm like, I have no idea on this one. So he did a great job today picking out the songs that really goes well with this, and I appreciate Rick's transition, too, because that goes really good into what I'm going to talk about today. But Surprise, surprise, we're back in John. This is actually part two from last week. So part one was two men part A. This is two men part B or part two. <laughs> if you guys didn't know that. But this is uh, the second half of uh, this short series I'm doing. Um, last week we talked about the official son who was miraculous, miraculously healed which is the second sign of the seven signs in the gospel according to John. So there's seven signs that John places in the gospel according to John on purpose to point to who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world, right? And so those are what the purpose of the seven signs are for. And last week we saw that Jesus entered into Galilee, but they didn't honor him and they're welcoming him because they were what I called sign chasers. Just like storm chasers chase tornadoes, they were sign chasers. And we're supposed to be, as believers, we're supposed to be sun chasers, right? We're supposed to chase the, Jesus Christ. And through this miraculous, through this desperation of this royal official, we saw how Jesus showed him compassion and healed him, son, from a great distance, showing Jesus to be greater than all the other miracle workers who had to be close. The closer you were, the less power you had as a miracle worker, as a healer. 
And so Jesus could heal, not like the prophets who could heal like next to the person who was sick, but he could heal from a great distance of 25 miles. He performed a great miracle, and it shows that Jesus is greater than the prophets, right? The miracle workers of the Old Testament. And the boy was healed on the way. The servants came, and they told the official son, hey, your boy is well. And due to this, the belief of the man went from a head knowledge, believing that Jesus could heal his son out of desperation, to a heart knowledge, to trusting in Jesus Christ. He says he and his whole, fam- his whole household believed in Jesus. They began to trust in him as their Lord and Savior. And so the, he brought them into the kingdom of heaven through this miracle, through this sign. The sign served its purpose for this family. The sign did not serve its purpose for the Galileans. That leads us up to part two today. We're going to look at Jesus heals a lame man in in John chapter 5. Let's stand and hear the word of the Lord. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays, holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him, he knew he had been ill for a long time. He asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man, who has cured, uh, who was cured, who, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning, or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who healed him. You may be seated. This is a hard sermon to preach. I mean, it's not easy to preach this one. And I feel like sometimes I'm up here preaching to myself. But we're going to see something interesting happen today when Jesus, tried, when Jesus heals this lame man. It says, afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. We don't know which holy day it was. But inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the Pool of Bethesda. The Pool of Bethesda started out as a reservoir for Jerusalem. So they, it was deep. So there were two porches. I mean, not, there were five porches. But there were two uh, wells of water, the upper, upper pool and the lower pool. The, in, in the lower pool, the pool of Bethesda was 13 meters deep. So it was a pretty deep pool. It wasn't a shallow pool at all. Bethesda means, in Hebrew, in Hebrew it means house of grace and mercy. And uh, there is a side in here uh, in one of the verses that says in Hebrew because in Aramaic it means house of disgrace. <laughs> So you want to get it right, which one you're referring to, house of mercy or house of grace in Hebrew. It had five porches. It was huge. It was next. It was in Jerusalem. And around this time period, a lot of crowds of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, they lay on the porches. They lay on the porches because sometimes within our faith, we can allow things to creep in that are idolatrous, that don't belong there. Sometimes we can synchronize things within even the Christian religion that don't belong there, that can become idolatrous. All around the pagan world, there were these pools dedicated to the god Asclepius, who was the god of healing, in the, the Greek god of healing, right? The pagan god of healing. Asclepius, in his lifetime, he was a real person. In his lifetime, he was a healer. He used herbs to heal people. But after his death, they turned him into a deity. And all around, the, all around the world, people started building these temples to Asclepius. Asclepius, you'll know the symbol because on our EMT symbols, we have Asclepius's rod, the snake around the pole, 
That's the, that's the rod of Asclepius, the god of healing. It's on every ambulance in the United States. It's on every ambulance pretty much around the world. The god of Asclepius, the symbol, his symbol. Well, sometimes we can allow these things to enter into our own faith, and it becomes idolatrous. Really, there's nothing in Scripture that no healing pools in the Old Testament. There's nothing. This all came from pagan religion sleep, sleeping into the Jewish tradition. In fact, does your Bibles... I want to take a poll of hands today. Does your Bibles include... Raise your hand if your Bible is include verse 4 in the Bible. Does your Bible include verse 4? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so five people have verse 4 in their Bibles. How, raise your hands if your Bible excludes verse 4. It skips right over it. Okay, so some of you don't know if your Bibles include verse 4 or verse 5. Does your, raise your, okay, let's do this again. If your Bible includes, ver, if it jumps from verse 3 to verse 4, raise your hand. I mean, verse 3 to verse 5, raise your hand. All right. Now, if your Bible includes verse 4, raise your hand. Okay, so we're split here. Okay, why doesn't verse 4 in some of the Bibles? Well, that's because this was a later edition by some of the scribes. This wasn't something that John wrote in the original, uh, in his original manuscript. Verse 4 says, if I can find it here. Yeah, waiting for the moving. It, my Bible says down at the bottom in very tiny print. Some manuscripts add writing for a certain amount a moment for the water for an angel of the Lord to come from time to time and stir the water. Well, this was probably the belief system of the Jewish people that an angel of the Lord would come and stir the water, but that wasn't what John wrote. That wasn't in the original, and this was, an, this was something that had crept into their, their religious system that was idolatrous, something that didn't belong there as a, as a way of Asclepius entering into their worship since this God of healing. It says, one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And I had to work, look it up in Greek. I wanted to know what his illness was. It just says he was sick. The word for sickness is also the word that they use in Greek for well, uh, um, um, weakness. So it could be interpreted as a weakness for 38 years or a sickness for 38 years. We don't know what it was that was plaguing this man for 38 years, but he had some kind of sickness or weakness. For 38 years. 38 years in this time period was an entire lifetime. The average lifespan of a person in the first century, of a man in the first century, was 40 years. So he has lived in his entire life, the entire lifespan of a person, the average person, with this weakness or sickness. Now let me tell you this, that I believe that some believers can walk around with a weakness or sickness for many years. And sometimes we don't allow God to heal that. I, I could ask you guys, what is one thing in your life that you wish that God would change? Something that's been plaguing you forever and ever. And some of you may not be able to think of anything, but I just say, turn to your spouse. They will tell you what that one thing is. <laughs> they know what that one thing is, right? You've been struggling with this your whole life. This is a weakness for you. This is some kind of... Uh, something that you cannot overcome through your own strength. Now, if you're dating, don't turn to your boyfriend or girlfriend. They think you're perfect. Ask your brother or sister. <laughs> but this man had been laying here at the pool for 38 years. I don't think he's paralyzed. I think, you know, how does a man stay at a pool for 38 years? Obviously, as a home, somehow he came there every day. He went home every day. He came back every day. He came home every day. He came back every day. Somebody fed him. Obviously, he could eat. He ate every day or he would be dead of starvation, right? The man wasn't helpless. The man wasn't helpless. He was sick or weak, but he wasn't helpless, when Jesus saw him, he knew he had been ill for a long time and asked, would you like to get well? Now, something interesting happened right before the Nicodemus. Jesus, it says in chapter 2, verses 23 and through 25, because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to believe in him. 
But Jesus didn't leave them because he knew human nature. No one needed to tell him what mankind is really like. Jesus knows the heart of every single person, right? Back in chapter 5, it says, When Jesus saw him, he knew he had been ill for a long time and asked him, Would you like to get well? Jesus didn't just heal the man. He asked him a question. Would you like to get well? And I want you to think about that one thing that's been bothering you your whole life. That one weakness, that one thing you can't get over. God can heal that in an instant. Would you like, do you want to get well? There's some people who are very comfortable and content with their current situation. I don't know if it's anger. I don't know if it's control, manipulation, lying, stealing. You can name any weakness that we might have. Our human nature is broken. And God, as when we come to Christ Jesus for our restoration through our transformation through the Holy Spirit, to reconcile us back to God, he can heal us of everything. He can do that. Do you want to be well? That is a question that Jesus asks all of us. There's that one thing. Do you want to be well of that one thing? Some people don't want to be well. Some people are very comfortable living in that weakness. But God wants to restore you back to the, your rightful image, the Imago Dei. Do you want to be well? He says, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. That is the lamest excuse. This lame man had the lamest excuse I've ever heard. He goes there every single day for 38 years. I can't when, when the water bubbles up. I don't have anybody help me in the pool. That is not true. He could have gotten in that pool if he wanted to. He didn't want to be well. Notice that word bubbles up. When's the last time we heard that word in John? The woman at the well, when Jesus talks about the bubbling up of the Holy Spirit inside of us. You know, Jesus is trying to get this man to exchange this false, idolatrous way of being for the real, the real of the Holy Spirit that really bubbles up inside of us. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. For 38 years, somebody has always gotten there ahead of me. I heard one preacher say one time, you know, couldn't he just, you know, just kind of lay on the side of the pool like this? And when it was time to bubble up, couldn't he just go... You know, couldn't he just do that? I mean, for 38 years, the man couldn't roll over into the pool? You mean, this is a lame excuse. Come on. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. You know, how often do we have an excuse for our weaknesses? It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. I, you got to take responsibility. There comes a point in your life where you have to say, this is on me. This is my fault. Okay, I know there's some outstanding circumstances that were outside of my control that led me into this, but this is on me. This comes down to my relationship with Jesus Christ. Do I really want him to heal me? This goes into what Rick was saying about free will. We have a free will. Are we going to choose the path of Jesus Christ or are we going to choose the path of our own way? Right? It's a hard sermon to preach. I'm preaching to myself. He says, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Doesn't say anything else. But I, I find it interesting that this man somehow listens to Jesus. He doesn't, like, argue with Jesus. He must have, like, heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that testimony, Jesus with Nicodemus at night, when Jesus... Uh, is when the Holy Spirit is drawing people, there are two testimonies. The testimony of Jesus, the testimony is us through, the testimony of Jesus through our testimony to others, right? When we disciple people, when we try to bring people to the Lord. And then there's that testimony of the Holy Spirit that draws them. There must have been some kind of Holy Spirit bubbling up inside of him saying, listen, right? Listen to the voice, Right? I, I can't prove that. It's not in the scripture, but usually when Jesus calls us, Jesus never acts alone. 
called perichoresis. If you want to know something about my theology, write this word down, perichoresis. And if you don't know how to spell it, Google Translate will help. Perichoresis, peri means around in Greek, around. Choresis means to dance, to dance around. The Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son never works alone. They always work together. The Trinity always works together. They dance. There's a dance that involves the Trinity. The dance around. When the Holy Spirit moves, the Son moves, the Father moves. It moves perfectly. It's a perfect dance. It's a beautiful dance. It's beautiful until we enter the picture because then God invites us into the dance and we start stepping on toes and we fall down and we don't know the dance and it takes us a long time to learn it. But it's a beautiful dance. And the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son, they do it perfectly. And they've been doing this dance, this dance of the Trinity for all eternity. All eternity. If you want to understand my theology, understand perichoresis. Dance around. Nobody moves alone. The Holy Spirit does not move alone. The Father does not move alone. The Son does not move alone. They move together. In all things, all things. It says instantly, instantly, the man was healed. Now, I don't want to shame anybody. We're, in a few months, maybe after I get out of chaplain school, I don't know when, we're going to come to John chapter 9, a man born blind. And there was this concept in the Jewish faith that if you had something bad happen to you, it's because you were a sinner or your parents were sinners or something bad happened to you because of your sin. When we get to John chapter 9, we're going to see that's not the case. We see the case, you know, with like uh, um, Elizabeth, who was barren, who was the mother of John the Baptist. She was barren not because of any sin. She was righteous. You know, the text has to clarify. She was righteous. Why did they have to clarify? Because everybody thought, well, it must be because some kind of sin in their life that they can't have children. Same way with Job. Job was a righteous man. The entire book of Job is in the, in the Old Testament to prove to the, the ancient people that, no, not everything that happens to you is because of your sin. But we are going to see today that this man is suffering because of his sin. We're going to look at a man in chapter 9 who John places directly in there to contrast with this man. A man who was not born, who was not born blind because of his sin. But here we see a man who is suffering, in this case, for his sin. Not every case. Sometimes we suffer because of our stupidity. I mean, it's true. Sometimes we just suffer the consequences of our own actions. We have free will, and sometimes when we mess up, we suffer from that, right? But here it says the man was finally healed instantly after 38 years, living his whole life with whatever it was that plagued him. The man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man, who was cured? You can't walk on the Sabbath. Law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. You know, they've seen this man before. He's been around Jerusalem for 38 years. He's been sick for 38 years, and they're more concerned that the guy is carrying his sleeping mat on a Sabbath than the fact that he got healed through a miracle. This was not the only man in the story that was being idolatrous. The Pharisees were also being idolatrous through their judgmentalism. They were so judgmental. They, they put laws on top of laws on top of laws so that you wouldn't break law, and they thought that they were the only ones that could keep, keep them. But in doing so, they were so arrogant and prideful that they were breaking their own laws and didn't even know it. They missed the miracle. They missed Jesus because they couldn't see beyond themselves. They could not see beyond themselves. They had created this false dichotomy religious system. It was their tradition that they couldn't see the real right in front of their eyes. This man was healed after 38 years. All they could see was that he was carrying a mat on the Sabbath, which isn't an explicit law in the Old Testament. That's how they interpreted the law. Right? But they don't realize that the only one that could do this kind of miracle was the lawgiver. The one who wrote the law. 
they're blind, right? They're just as blind as the blind men at the pool. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who says such a thing as that, they demanded. I think they knew. But he replied, the man didn't know, for Jesus disappeared into the crowd. Now, I want, I want us to think about what kind of person is sick for 38 years and is healed instantly, miraculously, and doesn't take a time to say thank you, doesn't take the time to, you know, what's your name? How did you do this? Why did you do this? He just leaves. There's a sense, of, kind of like a sense of entitlement going on here. It's a hard passage to interpret. How this could happen. How this could happen. He just picks up his mat and he goes. He goes home. Doesn't even stop to say thank you to the man who healed him after 38 years. What kind of person does that? Well, we're going to see that he had more than just this sickness. At the pool of mercy and grace, this man encountered a miraculous grace and mercy. And he doesn't even take the time to say thank you. The man didn't know Jesus disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well. Stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. What worse could happen than being sick your whole life? The entire lifespan of an average person. What worse could happen? Well, Jesus is going to tell us next week eternal damnation. Eternal damnation is a lot worse than being sick for 38 years. Total separation from the presence of God. Total separation from God's grace, his mercy, his love. Total separation for the rest of eternity is a lot worse than being sick for 38 years. I can guarantee you it's a lot worse. You know, a lot of people don't even believe in hell today. A lot of Christians don't believe in hell today. They believe in heaven. They believe in heaven. Yeah, when we die, we go to heaven, but they don't believe in hell anymore. And then they want to get into Greek language arguments, arguments that they don't really understand anyway. Jesus taught on separation, eternal separation, eternal damnation, eternal condemnation. Not for believers. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no, uh, there is no uh, guilt. There is no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are called to repent and to come back to God and confess our sins. And he will graciously forgive us of our sins. But for those who are not in Christ, there is guilt. There is shame. There is condemnation for those who are not in Christ. And if they do not stop and repent and turn to Christ... There will be eternal separation. And that is a lot worse than whatever they're dealing with in the moment. Sometimes what we're dealing with in the moment blinds us to what effects this is having on us for all eternity. Then the man went and the Jewish leaders and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. You know, not only was this man not grateful for the great miracle that Jesus did, but he goes back, he goes back and throws Jesus under the bus. He goes back and throws Jesus under the bus. John chapter 1. Verse 11 says, he came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So what is the purpose of John putting this passage here? What, this is the third sign. The third sign of the seven signs. What is the purpose? Well, so far, everything's been good. 
Jesus goes to Samaritan and, and, and brings the lowest of the low into the kingdom of God. He heals the Roman son, uh, official son, uh, the, uh, the Herodian son, and his whole household leaves. What we're going to see from this point forward in John is an increasing resistance to Jesus. An increasing, so, so far we haven't seen much resistance to Jesus. But we're going to see an increasing resistance to Jesus until we finish the book of glory and we get to the book, I mean the book of signs and get to the book of glory, Jesus' passion. So everything from this point forward is going to be projecting towards the passion of Jesus and his rejection. We all stand in the shoes of the lame man every once in a while, don't we? Sometimes we have that sin. Sometimes we're ungrateful. We're all messed up. But the moment we turn to Jesus and say, forgive me, and we repent, that all goes away instantly through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing left. Jesus felt rejection. He was a man. He came and took on flesh and dwelt among us. Hebrews talks about how he was like us in every way. He even was tempted, but did not sin. That's the only difference between Jesus and us in our humanity is he did not sin. He felt everything. And I was trying to like, how does this apply to us? You know, we, we see the sinful part. Yes, we need to repent. We need to, we need to continue to allow the Holy Spirit to Restore us and renew us into the image of God. But also, when you go out and you do ministry, you're going to face rejection. Who has ever been rejected trying to tell somebody about Jesus? It's going to happen, and it hurts. It's painful. Jesus came to heal this man to bring him into the kingdom, and it hurts when he says no. It hurts when Jesus gets slapped in the face by the people he came to heal and to love and to restore. It's painful. It's painful for us when we go out and tell others about Jesus and they say, get out of here. Get out of here. Right? Jesus says, if they hate you, remember, they hated me first. They hate me more. If they hate you, they're hating me. He said, why? Because we bring people Christ. Christ lives in us through the Holy Spirit. When we witness people, we're witnessing through the Holy Spirit. And so in the first case, with man A, we see a man who responds in a very genuine way, the right way, the way that you should respond. The the official son was healed and the entire household was saved through this miracle, this great miracle. And here we see Jesus greater than Asclepius, greater than the God of healing. And the man's blind and he can't see it. He's so blind in his sin, he can't see the great miracle that Jesus has done and rejects Jesus right there on the spot. So, man B, we're going to get both of these. Like Rick was saying earlier, there's free will. People aren't always going to say yes to Jesus. Sometimes we don't say yes to Jesus. I hope the Holy Spirit convicts you to say yes to Jesus when those times come. But we don't always say yes, do we? Sometimes we fall down right on our face. I fall down on my face all the time. I wish this story had a happy ending, but it doesn't. It gets worse from here. And so next week we're going to see what happens next. But, you know... I think John wanted us to see these two men. And in a few months, we'll see the man born blind and see what radical similarities there are between these two stories and how another man responds quite differently who was born blind. I just encourage you guys today to take these words to heart. I don't know who I'm preaching to. I'm preaching to myself, like I said. Is there something in your life that, you know, been lingering for years and years and it's still not under control yet how are we going to surrender that to God have you faced rejection in your ministry has that hurt you of course it has well return to the water of the living spirit and allow him to fill you up and bubble up inside you because Jesus went through the exact same thing, and we have a great comforter in him, don't we? Let me close this out in prayer today. 
Father God, we just thank you for the Holy Spirit that bubbles up inside of us through and brings us to a greater experience with you and your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the, the great sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Father, I just, I just pray that you forgive us for those times that we have rejected you, that all those times that we have that you've been coming to us to bring healing and restoration, and we've said, no, Father. Father, today we say, yes, please forgive us. Please restore us and renew us in the image of your Son. Father, I pray for those who have faced rejection here, Father, that you will fill them with the peace that surpasses understanding and let them know that they're not being rejected. They're, those rejections come from and are directed towards those, those rejections are directed toward your son. Father God, I just pray, ask for healing and peace to come over this congregation. If there's anything, Father, that needs to be restored, don't let us leave this place before it takes place. I pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, there's the prayer ministry team. They're up here every single week to pray for you, to intercede on your behalf. If there is something that you want them to pray about, come get help. Amen.